Good evening. Blessed St. Herman of Alaska Day to all of you, even though we're after Vespers. And we know that um, we celebrated a, a, it was a 6 a.m. first hour service, an Akathist for St. Herman of Alaska, 9 a.m. liturgy. We just had this, uh, Vespers. And um, if there's something that really stands out about St. Herman uh, of Alaska, it is that he was, uh, he completely devoted his life. Christ in a way that, you know, we, we look at it, we say, oh, that's, that's, that's radical. You know, it's, it, it really is radical. It was, he, he gave away everything. Monasticism in itself is supposed to be radical. You know, you give away everything and get to the root of, of what life is all about, and that is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness of the, the you know, going after the pearl of great price. And so St. Herman did that, but he didn't just do it in a monastery, um, he did it out in the harshest of harsh climates uh, in Alaska. Why was it so important for St. Herman and for all the other saints who have um, been missionaries, uh, why was it so important for them to, to pursue this, to do this? And I, I think the answer is that um, it was the, the charge of Christ when he uh, ascended, and he told his disciples, go therefore and baptize all nations. Teach them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and the promise that he gives with that, and lo, I am with you always. You're not just going out on your own. I will be going with you. And uh, so this is what we see from St. Herman and from these other uh, evangelists and, and apostles. I'm going to talk about a few of the um, evangelists and apostles tonight. First, I just want to give you a word from uh, Father Thomas Hopko. Father Thomas, as you know, you, you are all reading or have read his books um, on the Orthodox faith. Uh, he is the son-in-law of Father Alexander Schmemann, who died 40 uh, years ago today on St. Herman's Feast in 1983. Um, and so Saint, uh, excuse me, so Father Thomas Hopko then, um, he said something that, what, that, that was very provocative for his hearers. And for some of our churches that are uh, mission-minded, uh, evangelistically minded, it, it doesn't sound so shocking. Uh, but, but at the time he said it, it was very shocking. That is, he said that a church is, that is not evangelistically minded is not a church at all. Or a church that is not evangelical is not a church at all, by definition. What does that mean? Well, Christ tells the apostles as he ascends to heaven, he gives them this one last command. And what is that? Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore. Preach the gospel, the good news, the evangelion, uh, that Christ is victorious, that Christ is the Messiah, that Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Go and preach the message of repentance and salvation of the kingdom of God. And, um, and so he, he, he tells them to go and to preach, to teach, and to baptize. And so the church, it is expected and commanded by Christ that the church is evangelistically minded. That means the church doesn't receive this thing and kind of keep it like this, you know, insular and protected from the world, you know, that... The church is full of people who are interested in doing this, you know, who are interested in taking this gift that we have received, you know, freely you have received, freely give. And so um, it is important for us then, as the church, to be mindful of this. Now, <clears throat> um, we can look to St. Paul, the Apostle the first of the examples that I have here iconographically depicted. St. Paul had been prepared. He had been chosen and prepared by God. And so in his very youth, he was educated. He poured himself into his studies to understanding um, the scriptures. 
he poured himself into it. And we can see, you know, he refers to himself uh, in ways that we might look and say, oh, that's kind of shocking the way he's speaking of himself so highly, you know. He's trying to communicate to people, I know what I'm talking about, and he did. You know, he was, he was, uh, he was fully versed in the scriptures. And when he met Christ on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus knocks him off of his horse and blinds him, and um, says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And once, once, uh, once the Apostle Paul gets the message that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the one that he had been waiting for, then everything flips. Paul goes from being a persecutor of the Christians to being the, the great evangelist. And he goes out and he brings the gospel anywhere and everywhere he can. He wants to, he wants to communicate the gospel to as many people as he possibly can while he still has breath on this earth. And Paul did it in his day, you know, anywhere he could, he could reach people that would hear him, in the synagogues or in the marketplace, uh, you know, the, the philosophers, he would reason with whoever was willing to listen to him. And, um, you know, this, this great education of his, his, with his great zeal and courage and um, the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, these things allowed him to engage with people where they were and to communicate the gospel to them. So we have this example of the Apostle Paul in, uh, in, in, in Acts and through his epistles um, about how important it was for those who were sent by Christ to communicate the gospel to people, to spread it. Then we come to the, I believe, 4th century. St. Neil was 4th century, am I correct in that? I believe she was fourth century, even though it doesn't say anything. But Saint uh, Saint Nina, we we wanted to uh, name our daughters after uh, evangelists. Um, we chose to, so we have Saint Nina in Lightner of Georgia. We have uh, Hannah is Saint Fotini, the woman at the well, uh, and we have uh, Miriam, who is Saint Mary Magdalene. All of them equals the apostles. And so St. Nina is the first of these, and um, she, her parents died when she was young, and she had this relationship with the Theotokos. She had some sort of a visitation or a vision uh, of the Theotokos, and, and it was her, her, her dream to bring the gospel to the people of Georgia. More to the story, but essentially she goes with an entourage, and she makes it to Georgia, and there are miracles that accompany uh, her trip there, and um, she ends up being the apostle to, to Georgia, the country, not the peaches. Um, hey, there's seconds. If anybody Here it is, guys. Is Please come and eat, or it's going to go in the trash. Don't let it go to waste. Don't Better let it go this food. Waste. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. So, Nina is, a, a, again, a few hundred years after Christ, here she is, this young teenage girl desiring to devote the entirety of her life to bringing the gospel of Christ to the people of Georgia who, who were pagan and did not have the gospel of Christ. We're going to fast forward a little bit. I mean, obviously we can talk about Cyril, Cyril and Methodius, the enlighteners of the Slavs. We could talk about St. Olga of Kiev, equal to the apostles. There are a number of them we could talk about. Uh, we could be here all night, but I'm just going to fast forward a little bit because I want to introduce you to some others. This is St. Nicholas uh, of Japan. <coughs> Nicholas, if I remember correctly, Nicholas wanted to go to Alaska, didn't he? And um, uh, St. Innocent, I think, if I remember correctly, was chosen before him, and so he went to Japan. And when he got to Japan, um, there was a, a samurai. Yes, sir? He, he runs into St. Innocent after he gets over the mountains. Later on in his life, he eats the same this and again. Got it. Thank you for that, Sergius. So St. Nicholas goes to Japan, and when he gets there, he encounters a samurai. I love this story. And the samurai says, I am here to kill you. And St. Nicholas says, oh. He says, do you know why I'm here? And the samurai says, no, 
Well, not really. He says, well, can I just, can you give me five minutes? Just a few minutes to just tell you why I'm here. And then after that, you can kill me. He says, very well. And so, St. Nicholas begins to talk, speak about the gospel, and this conversation goes on for a bit. And finally, the samurai gets up, and looks at him, and he says, I'll be back tomorrow to kill you. And so, the samurai leaves. Next day, he comes back, comes in, he says, I'm here to kill you. St. Nicholas says, okay, wouldn't you like to hear anything else about why I'm here? Very well, just a little bit. So he begins talking, telling, preaching him the gospel. At the end of this encounter, the samurai stands up and says, I will be back tomorrow, probably to kill you. <laughs> and then he comes the next day and he says, I'm here. Maybe before I kill you, you can tell me a little bit more about why you're here. Anyway, they rebuild this relationship. This samurai ends up becoming his first priest in Japan. There are pictures of them. St. Nicholas is like this, and the samurai is like this tall. <laughs> and it's just amazing. St. Nicholas is this just huge, hulking, you know, bishop. And, uh, and, and, and the samurai uh, is, is not. Anyway, so that's St. Nicholas of Japan. St. Nicholas of Japan um, translated the, the gospel into... Japanese into the language of the people so the people could understand it. Uh, he took care of people. Uh, he, he, he lived his life in such a way that the people loved him. Um, the, the, oh, you know, I bet Stephen, Stephen, do you have anything you want to add to this? No, uh, we went to this cathedral in Tokyo, which was really nice. And what's interesting now is, like, it actually has a, a Japanese bishop and a lot of Japanese priests, mm -hmm. which we weren't expecting. Like, we thought it was mostly Russian, but there are a surprising amount of Japanese converts and, Beautiful. and like I said, bishops and priests and deacons and everything. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes, Wait, Are you talking about the same the same Saint Nicholas? Oh, no, that was St. Nicholas of Myra and Lycia, that Santa Claus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is St. Nicholas of Japan. He is, not like, 19th century. Okay. Good, good question. So, anyway, St. Nicholas of Japan, again, if you read more about him, which I encourage you to do, you will see the types of missionary efforts that he had, the things that he was doing in order to reach the people, to uh, a, a, approach them in a way that they would receive and understand. St. Nicholas of Japan. Um, we celebrated, as I said today, St. Herman of Alaska. Here is St. Herman, St. Juvenali, and I can't remember the third, um, as they are arriving at Kodiak. And uh, I mentioned today in my homily that their trip was uh, nine months long across Russia and Siberia, and then, uh, you know, through the icy waters here, um, to get to Kodiak Island, nine months, it's hard to imagine. And, and they left, if I remember, they left at the end of December, if I remember correctly. So, um, at the end of December, Siberia, not a really happy trip, uh, but that, that it was worth it to them to bring the gospel to the people in America. That's, it was worth it to them to suffer that trip. But I'm going to say also that... Um, you know, the, the reason they were going there, they were not going there as evangelists per se to go and preach the gospel. They were going there to take care of the people who were suffering at the hands of the Russian fur traders. So they went in, and St. Herman in particular went in and befriended people and cared for people. He befriended children, and when a plague came in and killed the parents, then he took care of the orphans and he started a school. And he did things to serve the people, and they saw him as such an unusual shining light that when they talked to him, they were drawn to him, and through him they were drawn to Christ. So this, you know, this kind of harkens to the, uh, the, the teaching of St. Seraphim of Sarah, you know, acquire the spirit of peace and thousands around you will be saved. And of course that is a form of evangelism, a very prominent form of evangelism is that if we become saintly, like the fathers and mothers of the desert, People would travel from all over to come and just to talk to them for a few minutes, if you can imagine that, because they devoted their, their lives to Christ, to prayer, to fasting. They, they devoted their lives. Their, their life was so radically changed from their life in the world 
that uh, and, and they were acquiring the Holy Spirit, that people were drawn from all over just to come and have a short conversation with them. And, um, and that's where we get our books on the, the sayings of the Desert Fathers, because people would write down the things that they were told. Uh, and the, the disciples of these uh, fathers and mothers would write the things down as well. So that's why we have these compilations. <clears throat> but uh, that is, that is a, uh, a very prominent form of evangelism, people coming to you because they see something different in you, and that's very important. Uh, and so that's, that's again, uh, the example of St. Furman. St. Yaakov Nitzvetov, um, he was born in Alaska. Uh, he had a, uh, a, a Russian, I believe it was a Russian father and a native Alaskan mother. Uh, he was an evangelizer uh, on the uh, is it the Kuskokwim Delta, the Yukon River? He had, I can't remember the exact numbers, um, I, but he had one missionary trip. He baptized, I believe his last missionary trip, I believe he baptized 1,600 people. It's just astounding. Um, the, the, you can go through and read the logs that tell how many people he baptized, how many people he married, you know, on these dates, and I mean, just the things that he accomplished. It's just unbelievable. St. Yaakov Netzvetov. There was that missionary zeal, right? This desire to go and bring the gospel of Christ to people. I was at his uh, canonization, actually, in Alaska. Um, they didn't have his relics there because his relics are buried in a big uh, field in Sitka. And they didn't mark his grave. They know he's in this field, but they, nobody marked his grave. And so, um, anyway, we... we you, you, when you go to you pray at his grave, you just go to the corner of the field and you pray there. And he's out there it's in his field somewhere. Um, so, uh, but we had the um, his glorification service at Saint Innocent Cathedral in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and I remember that day; it was in the fall, and um, it was sunny and relatively warm. You know, when everything started, and then we went outside for the procession around the church, and it was ice raining. <laughs> and I was in short sleeves, uh, but you can't do that in Alaska. You you always have to have backup. But I didn't. But I learned quickly. Oh, no. That nineteen year old learned very quickly. <clears throat> Saint Innocent, Enlightener of Alaska. Um, he's another example of somebody who, um, you know, we don't have a huge list of miracles he was performing. We just don't. He's not one of these that. You know, like St. John, the wonder worker of Shanghai and San Francisco, you know, there's a book of miracles, right? You know, this happened, this happened. St. Innocent, uh, he, was, he was brilliant. Uh, he was evangelistically minded. He translated the gospel into the native people's language. Um, he met people where they were and sought to Christify what he could of their culture. Uh, he, he embraced them. They loved him. And, um, and he was also, he was very faithful. You know, it, there, there is a, one of the most famous stories is when he goes out to leave Sitka in his little kayak. And, the, and he wanted to go and, and serve the people and bring communion, you know, and, and, and serve liturgies. And, and uh, the people in Sitka, the natives begged him not to go. They said, nobody goes out on the sea at this time of year. You can't do it. You're, you will die. And he said, well, God will protect me. You know, and if not, you know, it's okay. I'm... I'm he just went, and they were all standing there waving goodbye for the last time on the shore. And they were very surprised when he returned home later, you know, a month or six weeks, I can't remember what it was, later in his little kayak. And they were shocked that this man, he was 6'4", he was a big guy. Um, he was, uh, he was a, a, a poet, a scientist, he was a carpenter. Um, he built a massive log orphanage that he lived in. Uh, and it had a seminary in it. I've been in it. It's absolutely gorgeous. The um, it was it was just trashed. It was completely trashed because of years and years and years of disrepair. You know, the Russian government cut off funding. Uh, I mean, decades and decades and almost a hundred years ago now, right? And so the church just tried to support it, but the church in Alaska was relatively poor. And so sometime around the year two thousand, the church sold it to the state. I think to the Park Service for a dollar. And the Park Service put 20-something million into restoring it to its original state. 
um, including crazy things that only the government does. <laughs> like the wallpaper for this place was from a wallpaper manufacturer in France. That place had gone out of business. And so they bought the business, they, they bought the rights to the thing, reopened the company so that they could remake the identical wallpaper. And then I guess they closed the company or sold it. I don't know what they did with it after that, but just this is what the government does. You know, they're like, well, let's see, what are we going to do? And that, so you're in this room, you know, surrounded by these things that are, they're, they're period pieces. They're just absolutely amazing. They've got St. <coughs> Innocent's sleigh bed there. It was, only, it was only six feet two inches. If that tells you something about his asceticism. He slept in a bed that he could not physically straighten out in. Um, so, anyway, it, it just just awesome. That's St. Innocent uh, of Alaska. There's more that I could say. If you have not bad read his book, An Indication of the Way into the Kingdom of Heaven, <coughs> it's very short, it's very succinct, and it helps. Like, he, he was trying to write a book and say, how can I communicate the faith to people in a, in a very simple and straightforward way, and that's what that book does. It's really wonderful work. And then another one I just pulled off the wall was Saint Sebastian. Um, we celebrated him a week or so ago, and again, Saint Sebastian was he, what he wanted to do was bring the gospel to America, and he did this by. Um, traveling all over the place. He was for a time the head of the uh, Serbian Mission Society, I can't remember what it was called, but um, you know, he was in Montana, uh, he was in Arizona, he was in Alaska, he started a church in Douglas Island, Alaska. Um, he, was, he was all over the place, uh, and that's what he wanted to devote his life to doing. So the reason I wanted to tell you about these, and of course these are only a few, and there are so many others, and there's this book, Glorified in America, and the vast majority of these saints were here spreading the gospel and unifying the, the uh, diaspora, the people, the Orthodox people who had immigrated here and had no churches. They were gathering them up and bringing them together, and they were um, working to spread the gospel while they were doing that at the same time. This is, it's a very good, expensive book. And I'm hoping to get a discount on it, as I said yesterday. If I can get, um, it's a long story short, but we'd have to buy something like 20 of them in order to get a discount, I think. Uh, so, and they're $40 each. So, anyway, I'm working on it, but uh, everybody should read that because it's, it's a very important piece. So, what does this mean for us? Well, first of all, anybody who doesn't think that the idea of uh, uh, evangelism or mission is an orthodox idea... Is just mistaken. Um, that's there has been in this country. There there became kind of a large sense of um, you know we're here in order to protect our church. Our people came over. We want to protect our culture. Easy to become kind of ethnic ghettos and you know really try to 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 to, to be faced inward toward each other. And um, and that's understandable in a sense. It's understandable. That if you leave, you know, if we left and went to another country and we were kind of spread around that we might say, you know, we should have an Orthodox church and we should try to, you know, really preserve the faith and our traditions and culture that we brought over with us, you know. But at some point, we have to turn around and say, wait a minute, what is the point? Why are we here? Why are we at the church? What are we doing? You know, because a, a major part of our faith is spreading the message, not just being insular. So um, that's number one. I, I, I wanted to just make that point because around here, a lot or most of us understand that. Uh, but some people who are Orthodox don't understand that. Um, but they should. We all should. So that's, that's number one. The other thing is that when you look at these saints, these missionaries, you know, what were they doing? I, I think pretty much all of the ones that I just talked about uh, were, were putting everything on the line. They were putting their lives on the line, all of their possessions on the line. They were, you know, putting their safety, the safety sometimes of their families. They were putting everything on the line for Christ. They, that's how important it was for them. 
that they get the gospel message out. It was They wanted people to understand what the Orthodox faith was about. They wanted to serve people. Uh, you know, especially in the person of St. Herman of Alaska, we see somebody who wanted, he, he really, his heart obviously was inclined toward being a vessel of love to all of these people who were suffering so terribly. That's why he went to Alaska. He went there to protect them uh, and, and ended up, uh, you know, just being a saint and a light in their midst. So what does that mean for us? Well, I talked a little bit this morning, and those of you who are here this morning, this will be a little redundant, so forgive me, but this morning I talked a little bit about the importance of us, what we really are set up to do here in southern Indiana. We have an opportunity. It is an opportunity. We have an opportunity of, uh, of, of bringing the gospel to people here who have never even heard of orthodoxy. Or if they have, they've completely misunderstood it. Um, and the way that we do that, we have to do it by taking a note from um, St. Uh, Seraphim of Serov, for example, and first acquiring the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, if we've been baptized and chrismated, then, you know, what does that mean for us? Didn't we receive the Holy Spirit on the day of our chrismation? The answer is yes. Uh, but we have to be living a life where, you know, if our, if our heart is a garden, you know, just because there was a beautiful uh, apple tree planted in the center of that garden, if we don't till and if we don't cultivate the soil and pull up the weeds and water and make sure it has sunlight and see to it that it's trimmed and pruned and all of these other things that we have to do to tend a garden, then we're not going to have a tree that's bearing fruit. So we have to take care of our soul. We have to make sure that we are seeing to the garden of our heart, tending it, so that it brings forth fruit. People will see the fruit, and much like St. Herman of Alaska or uh, some of the others that I mentioned, they'll see the fruit, and they'll say, That's, there's something different here, right? So we got to see, see to our own heart. Um, and then what do we do? Well, I mean, there's, there's local evangelism, which is uh, obviously very important. Uh, I won't talk about internet evangelism. We, we talked about that a little bit a, a few weeks ago, but obviously the internet is, is, is right now, it is central for evangelism. Uh, so that's something very important that we can talk about in a very, very closely future day. But the personal interactions that we have with people. I told the story of when I was out in <laughs> Richmond, uh, uh, Richmond, Indiana, after Thanksgiving coming home. And that I, you know, I had preached in, in New Jersey to all these people out there about the importance of, you know, every day our interactions, everything being an opportunity to be Christ to other people, you know. And we're driving home from, from uh, New Jersey, and we stop in Richmond because I wanted to look there at the mission field and just see, I know this is a city that needs a church. And so we, pull, we pulled into Starbucks, and there's a sign on the the drive through thing that says, sorry, we are only able to accept credit debit cards today, no cash. And so I went, oh man, that's terrible. And then I thought, well, these people are probably hurting right now because everybody's going to be arguing with them. So the woman came on, she says, hi, I'm so sorry, we can only accept debit and credit cards today. Is there something I can get for you for your order? And I said, I'm so sorry, that must be really hard on you. And there's just this silence on the other end of the microphone and she's like yeah it is really hard I said yeah I said I'm really sorry you're going through that and she's like thank, thank you and then by the time I got up to the window she had her manager standing next to her and he said he said your drinks on me today I said why you don't have to do that he said that's the first time anybody's ever expressed concern over one of us <laughs> in my years at Starbucks <clears throat> and I was just I was like wow that's profound. But that's, so, think about that. Those people were shocked that somebody cared to ask how they were doing. Really, like, actually asked. Not just, how's it going? Oh, good, yeah, me too. Can I have my drink? Right? So, we have to think in terms of everybody around us uh, needs to know the love of Christ. Needs to know the love of God. And we are the ones who, if we are being practicing being vessels of the Holy Spirit, doing everything that that entails, 
then uh, that can have an effect on people just through our simple interactions. And that's very, very important to do. So that's, there's, there's local, local, like person-to-person -person evangelism. Um, there's also evangelism on a larger level locally, but I want to take it out further than that and just say that uh, for us, we really have to see, until somebody else takes it, nobody else seems to be taking the baton and running, uh, we have to see southern Indiana as our mission field. And um, what that means is we have to understand that God has placed us here, unless he shows us clearly that somebody else is going to do the work, that God has placed us here, and that we have a responsibility for the people living around us. You know, you go far enough down south to New Albany, and you know, you've got Louisville over the border with a bunch of churches there and things like that, but think about the other towns. You know, Columbus doesn't have a church within an hour. Uh, I just mentioned Richmond. You know, it's at least 45 minutes to an hour to get to a church from there. These are cities, you know, college towns, right? Um, uh, Martinsville, 25, 30 minutes north. Bishop Anthony likes that idea. Uh, and, and, and beyond. You just kind of go out from there. So we have to be mind, we have to have the mind of evangelists. That's important for us as healthy Christians to think, what can I be doing for others outside of myself? So we do it for one another in the church. You hear somebody is struggling or sick, you don't see them at church for a couple of weeks, you realize maybe they should have a call. Uh, we do it for people outside the church. We find out how our neighbors are. That's important. Uh, we do it in our one-to-one -one interactions. Uh, we, we can do it at work. Harder at work, I know, because people, you know, People don't like mixing uh, uh, work and religion, and that's, I understand that. I do understand that. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, I, I Do you I know it a, from experience? I do, yeah. I had a boss who is, who, who is a co committed Christian in a company that I worked for in Alaska. And, uh, and I just, I remember at one point, it was, it was Pascha. It was like, I think, Bright Week, you know, after Pascha. And so I went <clears throat> into the bathroom, and Rich was in there. And uh, so Rich says to me, hey, Peter, what's the good news? I said, Christ is risen. And he said, uh -huh. what's the other good news? I said, if Christ is risen, what more news do you need, Rich? And then I walked out, and I found out about a month later that he was dying of cancer. You know, And um, he went through chemo and all this everything else, and finally he made it back to work. <coughs> And I remember he came up to me after he came back from all of this stuff, uh, and he said, I wanted you to know, he said, um, I've become involved in my church for the first time in a long time. I just wanted to say thank you. All I said was Christ is risen. That was all I said. We didn't have a big theological conversation. That's all I said. So that was at work in, in the men's room, right? So some, and I felt like God put that opportunity there, right? And apparently he did. So anyway... So our interactions, even at work, and then really being mission-minded in the larger sense of we have a we have a pretty unique opportunity here in Indiana. We really do. Um, you know, the northern part of Indiana, they have a good number of churches up there. The southern part, not so. We have a mission field, right? And this is it's a, it is a I mean Jesus says. Lift up your eyes. The harvest, you know, um, the harvest is great. The workers are few. So, um, anyway, I, I I am excited about this opportunity. I've been thinking about it for a long time, and I feel like it's something that we are we are being called to now to really begin to prepare for this, because I see what's happening here, and I know what's happening all over the country, and what that means is. People's hearts are prepared to receive in a way that they weren't maybe five or ten years ago. There is something happening right now that's just that's just unbelievable. Uh, and we can't say, it'll go on for a hundred years. We can't take that for granted. I feel like we have a limited time in which to work. A time when people's hearts are soft and prepared and receptive in a way that I have never seen in my lifetime. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you tonight about the Orthodox 
um, ethos, understanding of evangelism and mission. And, uh, and just let you know that it is my hope that we will be involved in it, not just playing catch here. It is important. We spend a lot of time playing catch here. We really do. And that's wonderful. But it's time to, to turn, out, turn outside of ourselves and start saying, who else is out there who needs to hear this message? Because whoever doesn't know it needs, it, needs to hear it. So. Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. My question is, in the Bible, I've read that God wants us to tell people about him. Okay. How do you exactly do that? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. How do you think you should do that? I don't know. I've just, when I was in kids' church, they would say that too. And I'm like, how am I supposed to do that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, it's, it's, I will tell you, first of all, that it's different depending on who you're talking to. Um, I remember Nina. Now, I'm going to talk about my kids because I love my kids and I'm proud of them. And I know the most stories about them. And since Nina's not here, I can tell this story. But I remember <laughs> when we were living on the north side of town... We were living next door to a Buddhist family, and uh, and and one day, Nina and the little girl were playing out in the backyard, and the little girl, I think they were eight, and the, the they were talking about something, and I think Nina said something like, what are you doing for Christmas? And she said, oh, it's Christmas, I, I don't believe in God, I don't think there's a, I don't think we do Christmas in my family. And then Nina says, well, why don't you believe in God? I'm not sure. I, I guess I've never really thought about that, but I, I just I, I don't believe in God. And so Nina goes and starts talking to her about, you know, the trees and the stars and how is all this stuff made if there was no God? And the little girl just starts to say, I, that never really occurred to me before. How that they go through this conversation. At the end of the conversation, the girl says, I've decided that I believe in God now. Okay, I don't think her parents ever let us talk to them after that. <laughs> um, but that was the first step, and who knows what happens after that. I don't know. We actually moved uh, a, a few months after that. But, um, but that, that God presented an opportunity, and Nina just stepped into it and said, why don't you believe in me? And then she used the example of the creation around her to try to say, did this stuff happen with no God? How did this happen? So that was, on that day, it worked. Different people, different interactions help. Uh, I saw Dave start to put his hand up. David, do you have a... Have an I just say, just tell what you know. No more, no less. There you go. Sure. So answer your question. I was doing grad school a few years ago. Oh, I like you, this story. It's you'll like this. Story. So um, there's a girl from China that came up to me in one of my graduate classes, and I, it just dawned on me at the last second, well, maybe this will help because uh, I wanted to give you something that maybe you can grab onto. So this young girl comes up, and she says, Thomas, broken English, you know, Thomas, can you please help me with my graduate paper? I have trouble with English, and I, I, I don't want to get a bad grade. And I said, Lon, I'd be happy to. Let me see it. So I get in her paper, and I just run through a proof, proofread, go over, like, whatever, eight, ten pages. I do a few checks here and there, fix a few things here, there, the other, and I go through pages fixing stuff. I go, there you go, Lon, that should do it. She turns it in. She goes, I got an A on the paper, Thomas. Thank you. What do I owe you or something like this? And I said, Lon, here's what, you, what I'd like you to do for me. I said, have you heard of Jesus in China? She says, ah, I hear of him, but we don't believe. We are all atheists where I come from. No belief in him, but I heard of him. I says, for me doing your paper, this is what I want you to do for me. I want you to leave school today, and I'd like you to say, Jesus, I talked to Thomas tonight. He told me to talk to you. If you're real, would you show yourself to me? I said, that's all I want you to do. Would you go do that for me? She goes, I do this for you. And she took off. <laughs> she took off like this, gone. Well, I'm at the graduate school work at another the paper because I did quite a few years in grad school, right? Changing majors, blah, blah, blah. So about a, I don't know, a couple weeks later, whatever, I'm in a school of education doing some more paper prep, and here comes Lon and her boyfriend driving up, you know, bands, very high end, very lot of cash, you know, money. And uh, she comes walking toward me. She goes, Thomas, I said, yeah, Lon. She goes, 
I did what you told me to do. And so I stop everything. I go, what did you do, Lon? She says, that night you told me? I said, yeah, I remember. She says, I went home alone in my room. And I said, Jesus? Everything I told her. And she said, he came to me. She converted to Christianity. And her boyfriend that she called Wei, we joke because Wei in Chinese, you know, Wei, I said, what's up, Wei? You know, like, hello, so I would joke with Wei. Wei ended up, fast forward, becoming, a, he was atheist. He became a Christian. Her brother in China was tied into the uh, Chinese, tri Chinese mafia, owed them a bunch of money. So by these two becoming Christian, they start <laughs> sending money back home to free her brother up from the, you know, the, the debt and that changed the whole family by just by saying, you help someone with the paper, be creative. Here, let me pay you. No, 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 no. Just go tonight. Mention Jesus. And that's what happened. Changed their lives. They became Christians from just that. Like right. you mentioned, that's it. That's the story you, you that was saying? Uh, yeah. I'm Make sure you're making sure because I got a few of them. I know you do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so it, it took, it, it takes a little bit of boldness because she could have said, I'm an atheist. I, I think Christians are dumb and I can't believe you just said that to me. Right? She could have said that. That's not the way it went down. But he was willing to take that answer if that's what she gave. So sometimes it's just a matter of being willing to, uh, as St. Paul says, to, to uh, give an answer for the hope that is in us. To be willing to just, um, you know, like when I talk to people about death, I mean, I've been around death a lot. I, I was looking at the sheet of people that I buried from All Saints, and when I got here, there were four names on it. Edith. George, Constantine, and David, and now it is a full paragraph. I have never counted how many names, but I've been around death a lot. And, um, and when I'm talking to families who aren't around death a lot, you know, I need to be able to communicate with them why this for me is not a horrible moment. You know? And that's important because uh, for people who don't believe in God or people who uh, don't know what the church teaches about uh, Christ's victory over death, then that can be a very powerful message for them. Um, and we have people here who they didn't come to church for a decade and then a family member died and they hear the, the gospel of hope preached and it brings them back into the church. So, thank God. And sometimes, I, I remember a woman who's 96 years old. Rhonda checked her watch. Rhonda, I'm sorry. I go oh, along. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I notice everything. <laughs> um, so anyway, so so now I lost my train of thought. That was on purpose. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm just sorry. joking. A ninety-year-old woman. Ninety-six-year-old woman. She said, she she became Orthodox, and I said, why on earth? I mean, God bless you for it, but why did you become Orthodox at ninety-six? And she had been she had been Roman Catholic actually, and uh, she said, you know, she said a friend died, an Orthodox friend. I went to the funeral. And she said, I realized these people are not afraid to call death what it is. She said, you, every, the, every word of that service was the truth. And the, the eulogy that the priest gave, it was all truth. It was bold. It was straightforward. And she go. said, this is the I truth. This is where I want to be. 96 years old. So you just don't know what people's hearts are prepared for. And we, we see this, you know, when, the, when, when Saint Innocent of Alaska arrived on the shores of Alaska, the natives were waiting for him. But how can you see these these people? Because I've been like around Christians all my life. Yeah. So I don't know how to find these people that need Jesus. They'll find you. Life. I see. Yeah, right. You don't have to find them. If if you're willing, then God will bring them into your midst. And he does all the heavy lifting. That's right. He does that a lot. Ask him. When you wake up in the morning, say, Dear Jesus, I don't know how to find these people. But if you show me I'm willing to do what you want me to do, be ready. Because you may get bumped at someone at the checkout line, and she may just grumble, and you say, Oh, I noticed you sighed. What's wrong? Oh, my brother's in the hospital, whatever. Do you want to pray? Then if you need help with that, you get with us, and we can show you those basics. But I'm going to share one more thing, if I may, with class. Because I deal with a lot of students at IU. I was in uh, grad school maybe 10 years ago on a, a legal course, case law. 
and um, I'm surrounded by a lot of different majors, PhD in this, masters in that, whatever, just doing this, uh, whatever. I don't know why they were in legal, but I was studying law because I'm, I'm a licensed school principal, so I got to know a certain amount of law, obviously admin law, school law, that type of thing. So we get to Roe v. Wade. I mean, everybody, ooh, as he say, don't talk about that. We're in Bloomington. So check this out. People start going off. Hey, I'm Catholic, but it's okay if she wants to have an abortion. Well, I'm Muslim. We don't believe a soul's infused till six months in the womb. And I'm taking it all in. Everybody got an opinion about why it's okay if their neighbor does it. And I'm like, man, I got to do something. Dr. Hostler, Thomas, Dr. Hostler, I'm sorry, but you know what I heard? The Muslim here says that he don't believe a soul's infused for nine, six months. You, you said you're Protestant. You believe that you won't do it, but it's okay for Susie next to you. And you're Catholic, and you said it's okay, and this and that and the other. And I said this. I said, the word of God is clear. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And this came out of left field. I said, do you realize what that means? God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That means you had an identity before you were even formed in your mother's womb. And I said, so who's going to stand for truth? I said, if you don't stand on this, I stand on a word. All you Christians in here, you all stand on something. We stand on some common ground. The common ground is some believe sola Christ, you know, Christ alone. But we, regardless, we stand on Christ, correct? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, 6. So I said, I stand with Christ I stand on his word, and I said, I will stand for truth in all this. The whole class shut down. The woman started crying. The doctor started crying. She came to me, and she says, my niece is blah, 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 having a lot of trouble. I can't say what she said, but she says, I will never teach this class again. So again, just willing to step. It broke the professor. She wept. Something convicted her. She says, I'll never teach this again. So you draw it from whatever you want, but that's what happened. So I would just share that. To be bold and let God use you where, where he will. Thank you. There you go. Last question, Thomas. You might be venting and I'll <laughs> listen to your comment. So, <clears throat> so as I get to my family, I let you get to know me. Um, two cultures of history for me coming to this point, Jordan Lopez. Protestant evangelical church in America, a non denominational church, was mad. You know, I was indoctrinated and, you know, pumped up with guitars and this, that, and the other thing to go get people on the same team, you know. And I didn't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's easy, as, it, it's very manipulative. So I'm, I have a little bit of a bent. I mean, I, I, not holding on to a resentment, but, like, this is crazy. So people running around, people get baptized, now they're singing on a stage, and all these terrible things happen, everyone kind of scratches their head, and eventually they're no longer Christian. And that's a lot of uh, the world and why they're not interested is solely because of people that claim to be Christian. So we all know this. Um, so I wanted to see if you had a comment about that. Um, and you did say... Uh, forget which saint said, acquire the spirit first. It's yeah. like, they totally missed that point, right? Because um, you cried once or got dunked in the water, that's not necessarily what the Orthodox Church believes. So, from another culture uh, of my my life, and Alcoholics Anonymous will say two similar things. Um, you cannot transmit what you have not received, so I believe you spoke to that. And the other one is, they argue for attraction rather than promotion. So as soon as in my history with AA, if people are really trying to get me to, they want to be my sponsor, so I'm just like, that's a terrible sign. I don't want anything to do with it. Because uh, someone's selling it. And I don't know people, whether they're conscious or not, really, in their heart they know whether we're trying to sell it. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, we see Jehovah's Witness on the corners, you know, they're, uh, they're very low key and I don't know. I wanted to unload those two points of kind of what a nightmare it is with the heterodox, personally. Uh, stirs me up a little bit. 
So I was, I was, those are, thank you very much for those points. So I was, I was uh, educated pretty heavily in sales. When I was in Alaska, um, our company was top in the field, and my brother and I were the sales department. And, and I don't say that to brag, I just mean, they trained us really well. We had all the expensive trainers come in, and you learn all the formulas and whatever else. And then I um, uh, went to college in Pennsylvania, and <laughs> one of my classes was evangelism explosion, how to, how to convert people. And, um, and what I realized was it was, it was the same sale, it was a sales tactic. It was what it was. I was learning the same stuff in college uh, uh, evangelism class as I was learning at these sales conferences up in Alaska. And, um, and so, you know, God bless people for, if their heart's in the right place, thank God, but, um, but it's 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 not. You're right. Things seem they seem like they're out of whack because they are. People, if you come into a church and you hear really good music, and you know everybody's waving their hands, and you get this really good feeling, and you say that must be the Holy Spirit, and then you you know join the church and you're baptized, and you know then you're living the life and you start using God speak. You know, brother, I just really want to lift you up in prayer, and uh, and we start speaking this language. But then what happens when hard things happen in life and all of a sudden this idea that you've been given, the, the health and wealth gospel, that if I'm serving God, things are going to go well, it starts to be uh, a, a difficulty. There starts to be a dissonance within you. And so you see people falling away. Um, th that can happen anywhere if people join the church for the wrong reason, you know. Uh, but, but, yeah, that's, you know, Jesus, Jesus told us about the way of the cross. And so... You know, we come into orthodoxy and we, we expect that. And we practice suffering by asceticism and things like this. Um, and when we pray, we say, I am the chief of sinners. And it's, it's a different worldview. It's a different phronima, a different ethos. It's a different way of looking at things. Um, and so, anyway, that's, that's just to try to answer your, your first question, at least from my limited life experience. Um, and then, I just agree with you on the second, you know, I, I think... You know, we, we can't give what we don't have. God can make up what is lacking, and he does. So if we're striving for holiness, we're striving for the Holy Spirit, we're striving for this, that, and we're falling short, God can certainly come in and, 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 and make up what is lacking. Thanks be to God for that. Um, but we, we can't be negligent. We can't be negligent with our salvation, because it will affect other people, inevitably. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for your questions, comments, and everything else. God bless you. And for those who are able, we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for Divine Liturgy. Christ is in our midst. He is and never shall be. be.